Thanks very much for all being here. Thanks for having me here in Jersey. It's my first time to Jersey. Um, as Matt said, I'm uh, the editor of probably the widest distributed Linux and open source magazine um, in the world, but that's also probably because uh, we give it away for free after nine months. Um, before that, uh, I was the editor of Linux Format, which is the biggest selling Linux and open source magazine. Um, and really what I wanted to do today is kind of talk about my own personal journey, um, not in a sycophantic way, but in a way that um, open source excites me, in the way that um, that's led me to this point. Because um, I was never a journalist, um, I was a computer scientist, um, but to start that, I'll, I'll start this. So the next Voice magazine, I'll just say a brief bit about it, I'm not a salesman, but it's interesting in that we... Um, we all left Linux format um, at the same time, so four members of the team, um, and we crowdfunded Linux Voice. So we got $200,000 on Indiegogo to create an, an open source magazine. Um, this is despite the fact that uh, print is dead um, and that publishing is in decline. Um, and really what I think that says is it's, it's the only magazine of its kind, it's the only successful magazine that have been crowdfunded and we've been doing it for over a year now. Um, you can buy us in all news agents around the world, um, and so far so good. Um, it's difficult, it takes a lot of work, but the point is, I think, that open source, um, it uh, invests people with, um, they care about their community and they care about where it's going, and that's, that's really the emphasis of my talk. So, um, it's only in a few parts, um, and I don't really read the things off the slides. So what I'm going to do is start um, right at the very beginning. Um, these are kind of abstract. Open source is liberating. So I'm a child of the 80s. Um, back in 1982 or whatever it was, my parents uh, agreed that I should have a computer. That's what everybody was doing. Um, it was obviously becoming a big thing. Um, like lots of people who didn't have much money, they didn't want me playing games on it all the time either. So um, they bought me an Acorn Electron. Um, Acorn Electron is the cheaper model of the BBC. Um, we couldn't afford the BBC, but um, they, they, Acorn did a very good job of marketing it and making it educational because it, it runs basic. Um, so did all the other users at the time, but there, there was some, I don't know, BBC gave it some kind of, uh, invested it with some uh, kind of authority. So my first computer was an Electron. Um, I turned it on. This is what you see. This is what you see when you turn on a computer in the 80s. You know, they turned on within an instant. This is awesome. When I saw this, I couldn't believe that this was a machine that you could just, it felt like you could do anything with it. And that, as you can see, that has never left me. This is what was so important. Of course, as soon as you do stuff like that with it, the opportunities and the, the all the other things that you do, you just, they, they just grow exponentially. Um, I don't want to miss any of my notes because I, I want to get them on. And my target. So this is the kind of stuff that I would do. You go into a shop actually where they had a corner electron show on the TV and this is pretty much the extent of my programming at the time and my typing at the time. Um, There's a nice use of the random function which is a really neat BBC feature. Um, you can do anything with uh, BBC Basic and you still can do anything with BBC Basic. Um, and my parents were pleased, got me excited about computers. Um, that's what it does. Right. A little while later, I was able to convince them that the Acorn Electron had too few colours. It only had like four or five colours. All of which were just shown then in mode two, which is a terrible ugly mode. Commodore 64 was much, much better. I convinced them that um, much more powerful CPU, much more RAM, many more colours, and an awesome sound chip. In fact, the sound chip to the Commodore 64 is a, is a sound interface device. The um, sound chip from the Commodore 64 I got for Christmas in 1985, um, I've still got embedded within a little PCB that then I use it as a synthesizer. Um, and my, my Christmas when I came downstairs and my parents had got me the Commodore 64 was like my best ever Christmas. And of course, I didn't use it for programming. I used it for playing games. Um, Monty Mole, Monty on the Run, this is a sequel to Monty Mole, being, uh, being one of my favorites. Um, and the, the point that I'm trying to make is that computers, um, it was a bit like the Wright brothers 
um, for computing. It, anybody could do anything. These games are written by one or two people, and they were put together by small teams, and they were understandable. People could share what they understood about computers with one another, they could share their code, they could share their tips. Well, the hardware reference guides to how many of the, the chips inside these machines cost money, there was no real restriction in how you shared it. Um, that was just to show that uh, GM the skill, brain the skill was still uh, important. So, um, moving on a bit, um, I did computer studies at school. It was, it was easy when you grew up in the 80s and you spent all your time from computers. Um, I then went on to university and did computer science. And then by about 1992, 93, when I graduated, I got my first job at uh, Seven Trent, a water company in the Midlands. This is what I had to spend all my time with. Um, this is Windows 3.11. So in those intervening years, mainly I would argue because Commodore really messed up with the Commodore Amiga. Um, but IBM created their PC um, and everybody else created PC-80 clones because IBM basically failed to patent their, their slots and the BIOS was reverse engineered. Um, now, in fact, Microsoft wrote part of the code in the original BASIC. Microsoft obviously wrote the DOS that went on all of these PCs um, and Microsoft became hugely dominated and um, dominant with uh, Windows, uh, Windows 11. This is the beginning of um, what seemed to me when I graduated the way that computers were going to go. And there's nothing intrinsically wrong with it. I, I don't have a problem with it. Um, in, and it's used in lots of places still. I mean, not Windows 3.11, but there's Windows XP. Um, and the point is that, for me anyway, there was a lot of excitement lost. And I couldn't really see my way forward in computing. In fact, I, I thought for a long time whether I would stay in computing. And, and, and in fact, for a little while, I didn't. Um, I came back to Windows a little bit later, about the 95 time, and started carrying on with my programming with uh, uh, Visual Studio at the time and C, C++. Um, and then I hit another wall. Um, Visual Studio was an expensive piece of software, and depending on how much money you spent, this is something like 1995, 1996, um, it governed how um, liberal you could be in sharing your code. You could share the binaries or you could share the source code. But because everything was bound, basically, to Microsoft's APIs, you were limited in how you could share it. Now, I suppose you could see where I'm going, but I found that um, the antithesis of, of what I enjoyed about computing, and computing to me had been so vitally important. Um, and, and that was really something that led me away um, from computers. Um, now, at about this time, I'll, uh, this is the next chapter, really. At about the same time, well, early 90s, really, um, this post from Linus Torvalds was uh, put on uh, Usenet, on the Usenet group, um, comp.os.minix. It's still there. So Linus Torvalds um, started to create his own kernel, um, the part at the heart of a computer that deals with memory and, and deals with, uh, with processes. Um, this is um, such a modest, I don't know if you've seen this before, it's such a modest post. He says that um, it won't be big and professional like GNU. Um, and really this captured a lot of other developers' imagination. And the, the reason why this is successful and the reason why Git went on to become successful is because there was a mechanism in place for Linux to be able to release his kernel or to release, the, this, is, this is the nascent version of the kernel. The kernel wasn't, at, the 1.0 wasn't actually released for another year or so. In fact, we're only on like 3.18, 3.19 now. So, I'm slowing down a bit now. Going back a little bit, the reason why there was um, something in place for Linus to be able to release the kernel was Richard Stallman. Now, Richard Stallman, um, he's an, a hacker in the old sense of the word, um, and he would argue the only sense of the word, in that he uses computers for fun and to do neat stuff. Um, and Richard Stallman was a hacker at MIT, that was back in the 70s, the best possible place to be if you were into computers. Um, and a bit like us in the 80s on our home computers, they shared everything they did, in particular because computing resources were so uh, restricted, 
they created a time slot mechanism, a time sharing mechanism, and they gave the source code to this to everybody. They gave the code that helps people run the same programs to everybody who asked for it. Um, in the very early 80s, um, Stallman, the company that owned the, the PC, the computers, upgraded the hardware and decided to go for a proprietary time sharing solution which stopped Richard and his colleagues sharing the code. And to Richard Stallman in particular, this seemed like completely the wrong thing to do. Now, Richard Stallman is um, he's an inspirational person, but he can be very difficult. And even to this day, he doesn't budge from this opinion about free software. And a lot of us have a much softer approach. But the reason why I'm talking about it is because I think at the beginning, it took that kind of, um, that kind of personality to push through such uh, important ideas. And those ideas are the GNU manifesto. This is, GNU is a geeky joke. Um, Unfortunately, because this is the kind of person that Richard Stallman is, GNU is GNU is not Unix. So the GNU is self-referenced, so it's a recursive acronym. Um, those of us who spend our time in open source and free software always have to explain this, and the GNU sound is used throughout open source software. Um, but it all stems back to Richard Stallman and his manifesto. Um, this is really a philosophical paper more than a, a computer paper, um, and really, it sets in motion the principles of um, studying, sharing, and modifying software code. Um, so his manifesto was followed by the mechanisms to be able to do that. And that's uh, the license, the license that legally enacts those ideas that Stallman had. And St Richard Stallman was able to create a foundation, the Free Software Foundation, and the legal framework and the licenses and put it in such a concise and legal way with help pro bono from loads of other people um, that they created a genuine way of publishing free source code um, that could be used by other people. Um, and there were a few caveats to the way it could be used. Um, these have changed over the years. This is version three of the license. Um, there was version one initially, version two is the version that Linus told, chose to release the kernel under. And it basically means that if you use the code and you modify it, you've got to release your code as well. Um, if you use your code and you don't modify and you use it internally, you don't have to release it. Um, and, and, and there's these kind of restrictions, but it, it basically led to a cascade of people understanding that their code isn't going to be subverted, people are going to have have to release any changes they make to their hardware. And this is what I think really impassioned people to Linus's um, uh, Usenet posting. It meant that they could work on Linus's kernel. Um, other people could take the kernel, they could work in it, they could make it run on their hardware, and they could share their changes back, and everybody benefited. And I think going back to Stallman's original kind of mentality back in the 70s, um, it's, it's much more of a scientific idea that you have you and I have an idea. Um, when we share our ideas, we both have two ideas. Um, this isn't um, kind of socialism. This is, the, this is a pragmatic moving things forward that we can all benefit from. Um, and even though Stallman might actually say this is closer to socialism, that's not how the majority of people took it. And it's not how Linus Torvalds took it either. Um, so um, with the GPL, Linux kernel development exploded. Um, this is really the first big open source software project. This is in the mid to late 90s. Um, and the reason why I'm explaining this is because it's at this point that um, it stops becoming kind of an idealism and, and starts becoming a practical, um, of practical use. I mean, it's at this point um, I want to mention Eric S. Raymond right now. He's another famous geek. Um, quite difficult to deal with, like Richard Stallman. But he wrote a, a very influential book um, called The Cathedral and the Bazaar. It was both basically a post and a presentation before becoming a book in 1999. And The Cathedral and the Bazaar was written after he'd watched developers writing code and contributing code on the Linux kernel, and how the quality of the kernel started to get better and better and better as people kind of adjusted um, their changes and people criticized. Uh, and people rejected changes. Um, 
And the cathedral in the cathedral in the bazaar is proprietary software. It's, um, it's an edict and it's a law given to people. Um, and that works for some companies, but the bazaar is the kernel development model. Um, and the cathedral in the bazaar is this turning point, I think, in, in the difference between um, it becoming an ideology and it becoming an actual recognizable different way of doing things. And the first person to take it away from this is a subliminal advert. This is Tim O'Reilly. Um, and in the late 90s, he was, a, he was the publisher of O'Reilly. Um, and he created the, uh, the, from being a technical writer initially, he started this publishing empire, which was huge in the late 90s. Um, but importantly, I mean, he didn't say it till later, but he, he's famously quoted, uh, create more value than you capture. He said that a lot later, but his idea behind that was already evident in the, in the late 90s. There was no DRM on PDFs, on, a DRM on e-books. He understood that there, was, there needed to be a feedback culture in the way that people dealt with things. And that came directly, actually, from Eric Raymond. Um, this is what created this huge amount of momentum toward the late 90s. It's the start of Google. 1998 is when Google started. Um, Google could never have, I don't think, done this with proprietary software because even in the early days they needed ten, tens of thousands of servers with tens of thousands of kernels running on these things. It allowed them to grow at their, their ridiculous rate. Um, and at the, here at this point in the late 90s, it's the dot-com boom, um, and, and Linux has finally reached this kind of level of maturity. It's the Linux Apache MySQL PHP moment, um, where everybody thinks they can run an e-commerce website, which leads us on to um, transparency. Um, this is just the point where I start getting back into computers and realizing it's exciting again. Um, and I start programming again. Um, I created um, a popular application at the time, this is from the year 2000, 2001, um, a photo management application before Apple had thought of doing it. Um, and the point behind this is that the whole two tool chain, anybody could sit down at a computer, just like in the early 80s, um, and start writing their own code. And as soon as you start doing that, if it's, a natural, if it's a natural solution that other people feel is beneficial, they start contributing. Um, and you, you sit at this time, you just published your project on SourceForge, um, and you'd find strangers adding bits of code, lots of people doing translations that always comes first. Excuse me. Um, unfortunately, SourceForge is not what it used to be. Um, but this is where I started to get excited about computers and Linux in particular, because Linux is the whole software stack. Um, of, it's all built on open source software. The whole thing is free and freely distributable. That's what makes it important. Um, Richard Stallman likes to make the distinction that it's called GNU slash Linux, because Linux still really only refers to the kernel. Um, but because most of us have to deal with the real world, um, we say Linux. Similarly, um, Richard Stallman doesn't like to use the word, he, does, he hates open source. Open source to him, means that you're sharing your source code, which is the code that makes programs run and computers do things. Um, he uses the word free, free to Libra to explain that what he means isn't the fact that I can share my source code with you. It's your right as a user to be able to do what he thinks is important, as described in this manifesto. Um, open source can be subverted, and there are a million open source licenses now. And there are only a few uh, free software licenses. Um, so, this is when uh, Microsoft starts to take notice. Um, this is a spoof advert, actually, but I put it in because it's funny. And I think um, Microsoft, they're, an, they're very important in all of this. Um, they, they, they have and always have had, I think, the greatest pool of skilled engineers on the planet. And also, they run as a very democratic company. Um, but they potentially missed um, the rise of the internet. Um, um, maybe in the, they didn't miss the rise of smartphones because they, they had products out there. Um, but this is at a time when Internet Explorer was the only application you could use if you wanted to log into your bank. And open source and free software still have a lot of distance to cover. Um, however, on the server space, this is, this is um, the Netcraft statistics just from January. Um, so 
Apache is, an op is the open source web server that really transformed the internet in the dot-com era. So here, you can see the percentage that it had of all running websites is huge. Um, Microsoft actually did a very good job of catching up. It took a few years and it maybe took the dot-com bust here for it all to go kind of more competitive. And in fact, Microsoft looks like they're doing really well here, but Nginx um, is another competing, much more lightweight um, web server that's also doing well. But apart from the way things have gone here, you can see that Oh, this is open source. This is an open source software stack. Um, this is how open source basically, I think, democratized the internet. And for me, the internet is the future. There's not going to be, there's going to be a time in 10 or 15 or 20 years where it's just accepted. And it's very important that we have control of the internet through knowing the software that runs on it. And the only way of doing that is through open source. <coughs> So this is the time uh, when uh, Steve Ballmer called Linux a cancer that attaches itself to intellectual property. Um, and this a point here, I would say, is when things started to change. Microsoft do begin to get it. In fact, um, just last year, um, uh, that's, uh, Satya Nadella loves Linux, loves open source. Um, and in fact, for probably six or seven years, I don't know the percentages exactly, but Microsoft has been a huge contributor to the Linux kernel. Not just, not in generic stuff, but actually in stuff to help people run Linux on Microsoft's cloud, which is what all this is about. The cloud is the future. So, but what's really important is that Microsoft is no longer against open source. It doesn't see it as um, the enemy. Because Open source and proprietary software are too different, I think. Um, and then, then we need to find a way of making them complementary. It's not one taking over the other. And I think this is the point. Well, this is just last year, but Microsoft understands that open source is complementary. Um, maybe the real challenge here is Apple. Now, this is me with Linus Torvalds. Now, that is an iPhone. I'm interviewing in Linus with an iPhone. And he literally tried to throw me out of his house because I pulled out an iPhone to try and record the interview. To Linux, the Apple and the iPhone is the big scare story, but I'm not talking about scare stories. Apple actually uses a lot of free software and maybe like uh, Microsoft wouldn't be in the position it is. I mean, um, the networking stack, a lot of it, the, the way that the computers talk to one another is, is open source software. They still use a lot of VNC. The core of um, of our phones and our Macs is, is um, a different kind of kernel, but FreeBSD or NetBSD kernel. And it, it enables companies like Apple to get a lot of initial momentum to build the companies, the big companies that they want to build. Um, and just in the last year, um, the UK government has recognized, and this is related, that the old world of relying on Internet Explorer or on Microsoft Word um, is gone. What we need to do is we need to be open and more transparent. Um, and this, this is key. So now documents that come from the UK government have to be in, in a PDF, which is an open format despite originating with Adobe. Um, it's an open ISO format. Um, or ODF, which is the open document format standard that supports supported by LibreOffice. It's the native format of LibreOffice, which you can see running at the back there. LibreOffice is a fantastic office suite that's just as capable as um, MS Office in many ways. And what I find so exciting is that this is all happening on its own because it's the right way for things to go. Um, they recognize that you can't save documents to an SD card and then eight years later access them because Microsoft will have moved on with its formats. With PDFs and OBTs, that's not going to happen. This is this is what open source exists. This is the problem that open source exists to solve. Um, and I've got um, some other examples of an implementation. Um, this guy's name is Peter Hoffman, and we visited him last year. He's um, the guy in charge of a project called the Linux Project in Munich, uh, in Germany, and uh, he has been migrating all of the city's um, computers to Linux um, to a version of Ubuntu. Um, 
And the, he's been able to do this and save 10 million euros, but it's not the money, and it never is the money that I think is to do with any of these arguments. It's to do with Stormont's freedom. They're free to now not migrate and to never move again. They've got a working system. But also, they were free to keep their skills within the city of Munich. And this is how Peter was able to convince the city council to go ahead with this. This is actually surprisingly rare. What Munich has been able to do is create this wonderful IT infrastructure in supporting the council migrating to open source and Linux. And these are skills that are migratable. You can take them to lots of other places. Um, and they've been incredibly successful. They've just about finished. They're not even the biggest project. I haven't got a slide, but the uh, French gendarme, they've, they're migrating 85,000 PCs. All PCs and police stations in France are going to be running Linux. For very similar reasons. It's, it's cost, they, they save money in doing it, but it, it also gives them back control. These, these are computers that, you know, you could sit down in front of 3. Windows 3.11 and do the same thing. Um, and that really leads me on to my last chapter of my talk, which is, I think open source um, has become the default option. Um, things have changed a lot. Um, everybody lives, everybody's migrating everything to clouds and servers. Um, all development, a lot of development is done with open source frameworks. They start off open source frameworks as open source frameworks. They're on GitHub. Microsoft has its own GitHub account. So is the White House. Um, this is the way projects start, and it's the way that software development, I think, is recognized to be the natural place really, where everybody can talk together and, and contribute. Um, um, and I think this is through uh, greater transparency, um, better security, because it's a known given, um, and a much more agile form of development. Um, it's so much so that it's being used everywhere. I've got a, it's, it's used, I mean, Linux is in the middle of Android. Um, I've got an Ubuntu phone, which is released today. Um, that's running Linux. Set-top boxes and billions of web servers. Um, CERN, I think I've got a nice picture of CERN. All the main computational stuff is done on Linux, um, running open source software. I think more impressive than that, the backbone data um, is carried through open source software, it's managed through open software. I can't remember how many terabytes that they deal with every millisecond, but it's huge. And um, all the processing is done across a distributed network of computers in Europe. They're nowhere near Switzerland. Um, and it's incredibly impressive, in fact, if you get the chance, there's a, a real-time uh, Java app you can run that shows you the data spooling from uh, CERN to all of these different hubs. Um, this is a project that um, this is a, a company called Planet Labs. This is a satellite. This is the actual size of the satellite. Um, it's got a, a telescope and a camera. And here is an x86 PC running Ubuntu. Um, they're literally launching hundreds of them, pretty much throwing them out to the space shuttle. Um, and these go into orbit for a year or two years, and they constantly take pictures of the Earth's surface so that Planet Labs can offer a real-time update of the world's surface. Um, every 24 hours, they, they, they're aiming to get um, an update, a topographical update of the Earth. So much that they can, the resolution is such that they can find a single tree that's been cut down or track a single bow. Um, what's most important, though, is that the data is open, that the APIs that they're creating to access this data, anybody can use, um, with a caveat that they've not said how you can use that data yet. But they're not the only project doing it. Um, and then also, really just to finish up, my favorite project, that, um, this was released just last week. This is the Raspberry Pi. This is the Raspberry Pi Model 2. Um, they've sold four and a half million of these Raspberry Pi. Small Linux computers, they cost $35. Um, this, this new one is like a one gigahertz six core CPU with um, a gig of RAM. Um, they're fantastic, they're cheap, they get people invested in computing again. Um, it's changing the IT curriculum in the UK, although admittedly that's changed as well, that's a little discussion. But the Raspberry Pi is capturing people's imagination in the way that computers did right in the very beginning. And this is all open source. 
not every element of the actual hardware is open source. But the Broadcom, they, people get very funny about um, different parts of the chips, but they're trying very hard to get it all open source. Um, but the, the processor inside this, um, this little bit here is um, it's an ARM CPU. Um, and what is interesting, and to tie this all back to the beginning, is that Acorn, the company that made the Acorn Electron right at the very beginning of the story, when um, the BBCs went and the Archimedes died out, employees went and started ARM, the company that now makes probably the most widely used CPU architecture ever. It's low power and it's in all of our phones. And here it is on the Raspberry Pi. The same people that designed the Acorn Electron have helped put things like the Raspberry Pi into everybody's hands. Um, and they're being used everywhere. They're being used in manufacturing as much as they're being used by children to find, to shine flashy Christmas tree lights. Um, I really have no long how much that has lasted, but um, that was, uh, that's the end. I'm happy to take any questions if anybody has any. I'm, in, I'm here all afternoon as well if anybody wants to chat with me afterwards. Yeah? Would you say there are any large scale issues with open source in comparison to the most digital software model? No, I think um, there, are huge, there are huge issues if you were to migrate um, an office environment to um, Linux and open source. Um, but not, and they're not always technical. Um, at one place I work, for example, they tried to replace uh, MS Office with LibreOffice. And it wasn't that uh, LibreOffice wasn't technically up to the job. People had actually become attached or there was some kind of um, kudos attached to sending an email from Exchange that wasn't there if you used Thunderbird. And people actually felt like their, their value at the company diminished because they were using open source. And that's something that maybe only time can cure, I don't know. Um, and in fact, the Linux project, they, they don't tell people they're running Linux. They make it look like it's Windows. So um, people just carry on using it. Um, they, they change the icon to be an Internet Explorer icon. Um, but it, it's also a completely different ecosystem. So in a technical way, I think there's going to be lots of huge challenges. Um, yeah. Well, um, in the same line, recently there was a report that the Linux kernel was not migrating the same sort of environment you I think, um, I think in terms of the end result, the results can be better in a, in a more pragmatic way with open source, and that's when it should be used. Um, Microsoft, like with the, for this Raspberry Pi, for example, in the Model 2, Microsoft are doing a version of Windows 10 that's going to be free to use. I find it, I can understand why Microsoft's doing it, but I find it difficult to understand what the advantage is, it, is in it, because it, when you're using open source on a Raspberry Pi, it's transparent. You're just using it to get a job done. You're using it to fire signals on the pins or attach sensors or to plug something in. The fact, it's, it's neither here nor there that you're using open source, other than you can share what you're doing, you can talk about it. Um, that's, I don't think that's cultural, that's a pragmatic, better solution. Um, but that's different to the way that lots of developers think, or different to the way that projects may start. There are many important projects, like Apache or um, like Gnome, or, that have started really as a, as a cultural response to people not liking proprietary equivalents. And that's still there. It's still a hugely important part of it. Um, and, and I think it's important, I've not talked about it today, but software conservancy and, and fighting against um, lockdown is, is an important cultural part of what open source represents. But I don't think that come, that's a trade-off between how good it is at doing its job either. I think it's the best tool for the job. I and mean, if you use it in a proprietary way, use it however you want to. That's the whole point. It doesn't matter if you don't subscribe to the cultural side. Yeah? Uh, you mentioned earlier about uh, uh, Visual Studio being tied down to Microsoft. I was talking to a developer the other day who said uh, Microsoft has released a Visual Studio as open source model. I didn't know that. I know certainly since the late 90s their licensing has totally changed on how you can sh share and collaborate. And they tried lots of different free versions, but I didn't know a, a, a Visual Studio was open source. This is second hand. Right. right. No, that's correct. Though. They have open source as well as the .NET. .NET. 
Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the fact that they've um, open source.net is huge um, because it's for a long time, .NET is uh, uh, it's, it's the best way for programmers to actually access many of Microsoft technologies. And for a, a long time, and people in the open source community saw that as a conduit for developers to get locked into the Microsoft system. There's nothing wrong with it. Um, but now that it's open source, um, now that a lot of people can start programming in uh, C Sharp or whatever without any kind of guilty conscience, it's a huge change and it's a huge mind, change in mind shift for Microsoft, which I think is the more important thing. Um, Microsoft is a hugely important company. It's still got many tens of thousands of wonderful developers and they're, they're trying hard to do things. It's great that they're there. Um, and open source, I think, complements that in its existence and it's an important yin yang thing. Interesting that the .NET open source is actually in Xamarin. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and you know, a lot of people criticised him. So the, the, the guy that there was an open source version of .NET for a long time called Monarch. This is I don't know if this is getting too geeky. But the guy that created this open source version was also one of the guys that created the GNOME desktop, which is one of the main desktop environments in Linux, um, and. This was like in the late 90s. They actually got millions of dollars to create Easel, which was a file manager. This is back in the crazy days of the dot com. So, and this was all open source. But he has always recognized, he's perhaps the ultimate pragmatist, I keep saying the word pragmatic, because he recognized the great benefits in .NET to such an extent that he created the open source version. Um, companies like Novell took the open source version and used it as an interface between their open source um, clients and their proprietary clients and it served a huge purpose and that has been instrumental in Microsoft's changing attitude towards open source and .NET. Yeah. That's just like there with Microsoft in 2012, drop shot on its number of services. Do you think that might be because of the Azure cloud? Um, People who are just building websites there are not necessarily getting IIS, um, so to speak. If, it, if you were scanning that, you wouldn't get IIS. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. Um, I think I don't know how. Uh, they don't no say how many. They don't say how many. It's based on headers. Microsoft uses headers. Yeah, yeah. All the websites. So if, it doesn't matter whether it's an Azure or not. If it's got an I/O. <laughs> but how they how they're actually using there is your. I think twenty. I think Microsoft has said twenty percent of their processing is done on Linux through Azure. So. I don't think, I think Microsoft's actually doing quite well. I, I, I don't really understand these figures or, or what, what's kind of, these, these things are major releases in their web servers and other kind of major stories. Um, I don't know how relevant that might be. People, people and companies make, make money from writing and selling code. Yeah. If it's open sourced, um, where would they get their income from? This is the, that is a vitally important question. Um, the most successful company in open source is Red Hat. Um, Red Hat is now a large company. It makes its turnover is, in, is billions. And they do it purely by support. So all they, they're the biggest contributor to Linux. Um, they hire the most developers working on the kernel. Um, and what they do is it, all those changes are free. Um, they create an operating system called Red Hat, which is actually proprietary. It's, it's um, the binaries are shared with their customers and customers only. But anybody is free to recompile their source code and create their own exact replica of the distribution. <coughs> what Red Hat is doing is building um, a, a fundamental support system by guaranteeing those binaries and supporting their customers. So the important part isn't the innovation in the lines of code, it's in the service that comes after that. And I think that's where most people make money from open source. Following the same line on the Red Hat, I think kind of taking the same turn as well, but I mean maybe over the last four years or so. Yeah. Probably a lot of we gain more of the market share of the Yeah, Canonical's a, a really interesting story. So Canonical is, is the company that makes Ubuntu, which is probably the most popular version of Linux. Um, but it's, it's always been, it's been funded by a billionaire spaceman. Um, the, the guy that created uh, Ubuntu um, 
used to um, own Fort, which was one of the very first um, certification systems for the web and sold it for lots of money and wanted to create Ubuntu because he was into Linux. Um, but what they've had great difficulty doing is making money out of it, being the most successful Linux desktop. So they've, they're probably used in tens of millions of PCs and they don't see that much money from it. They've tried to affiliate with Dell, they've tried, they have got large install bases where they, they, they get paid for support, but not enough to support their company. And they haven't really found a great solution. The, the phone is their, is their next great hope um, because they can see how Android is done. But I think where Canonical is going to have success is in the cloud because um, anecdotally at least, the, the majority of instances running on Amazon EC2 are Ubuntu. It's the most popular distribution of choice for people running cloud servers at Amazon. But Amazon doesn't give any money back to Canonical. In fact, HP is the only cloud provider that gives money back to Canonical for all of them. So, in a way, Canonical hasn't seen that the success of cloud and that they should have created some kind of mechanism. They couldn't do it because it's open source in charging people for their code, but they could have done it in such a way of providing a level of support or a quality of service to HP or Amazon. Um, and they're trying to do that as well. In fact, Canonical, as well as the phone, they're doing really good things in creating kind of package managers for installing cloud applications, um, which is really on the cutting edge along with Docker. So they are doing some really good stuff, um, but they've yet to make lots of money out of it. I hope they do. Is that an Ubuntu phone? It is an Ubuntu phone released today. Yeah. You can have a look at it. Any other questions? Okay, well, you feel free to talk to me later on, and uh, thanks very much for your time, and thanks for having me.